You're tuned in, tuned up, and ready to go. Welcome to Ria's Ham Shack, a weekly conversation about amateur radio, shortwave listening, and radio tech, hosted by Ria Jiram and 2RJ, and heard weekly on WRMI Legends Shortwave. And now, here's your host, Ria. Well, hello everyone, happy Friday, and welcome to Ria's Ham Shack right here on WRMI. We do have a schedule change, and um, you can find out more on the WRMI Legends Facebook, the official WRMI Legends fan club. You can see that on Facebook. So, But generally, the, the show will be moving to a later time slot because of propagation. I mean, you know, we're hams. So, well, at least a lot of us are. You're, you're at the very least, you're a shortwave listener if you're listening on shortwave. All right, well, this week, we're going to talk a little bit about fires, wildfires, and such like that. And generally, how to, you know, some various discussions around how to keep yourself safe, and how hams have been active in wildfire response, and also some things about wildfires. I know last week I did in the Q&A about wildfires and ham radio propagation. And we'll also touch a little bit on field day. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be here for field day, but it's going to be pretty fun for a lot of you and how to make the most of points and how to get proclamations and all sorts of stuff. And field day is a contest, of course. And uh, um, we're going to make the most of it. And also the upcoming hurricane season and what you can do to prepare for any eventualities. Right here on Ria's Ham Shack, heard every week, every Friday on WRMI or on WRMILegends.com. But first, let's take a break and come right back. You love the news on Ria's Ham Shack, you're going to absolutely love the news on Ria's Substack. So to go to n2rj.substack.com where you'll find the news, views, and opinions, and all sorts of interesting angles that you will find nowhere else n2rj.substack.com it's a weekly newsletter it's absolutely free you can sign up you can tell your friends you can learn about all the happenings in ham radio for the past week and you know some interesting news views opinions and commentary which you'll really not find anywhere else n2rj.substack.com n2rj.substack.com we put it in your inbox once a week once a week and you get a convenient digest to read everything you need to know about amateur radio. N2RJ.substack.com, N2RJ.substack.com. Be sure to subscribe. So if you were in the East this week, particularly the Northeast, you might have heard, and you know for Californians and Coloradans and, and people in the Pacific Northwest, this is old hat for them because they experience a lot more wildfires than we do. But this week, actually, Canada, um, pretty much Eastern Canada is burning. And, you know, whether or not you agree that the cause is climate change, uh, the weather has been kind of weird because it's been kind of dry. And because of that, the forests have been really uh, pretty much a tinderbox. And then you have camping season. So people set up campfires. And some people don't do them responsibly. So to this, I would say, you know, if you're setting up a campfire, do it responsibly, please, because your campfire could be the next wildfire. Ham radio operators have been really instrumental in wildfire response. And there have been a few things that we have been doing with regard to wildfires. One of them is, of course, that we provide communications because wildfires burn all sorts of infrastructure and they burn a lot of cell towers. Mm -hmm. And it also has, especially in California, you have like power uh, uh, outages or, you know, related to wildfire. Whether whether it's actual power infrastructure getting burned or the power being shut off to prevent wildfires because, you know, these power lines, they arc and they produce fire. But this week, I mean, we are far from those wildfires. So here we've had a number of um, air quality alerts and we've had people basically go indoors. You know, it might be good to get on the net. Uh, We did this for COVID. It might be good to get on the net and check in and check in on people who are 
probably affected by this. You know, ham radio has a generally older demographic, for better or for worse. Um, we we have a lot of people who are, you know, who have um, illnesses and, and conditions. So it's good to check in on them. And during COVID, we had like these, we had these nets that would deal with health and welfare to see how people are doing help them get supplies and such like that. So maybe it'd be good to check in on people. You know, my newsletter, I report health and welfare, and it's a sad fact of life that there are people who are silent key and people suffering from their health. So uh, be a good neighbor, check out and, um, you know, check on your fellow hams. And wildfires, of course, the importance of spectrum for disaster response cannot be overstated because not only are we doing traditional voice communications or even like WinLink or anything or messages passed on HF and VHF, we're doing a fair amount of digital emergency amateur radio through things like Arden. And if you don't know what Arden is, the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. And that essentially uses digital, um, high-speed digital to pass emergency traffic and to be there for emergencies. And you can, one of the things that a lot of people out west have been doing, they've been setting up wildfire cameras so they can see when a wildfire starts and they can alert the authorities. This is a very, very nice part of amateur radio. Um, emergency communications is one of the things we do. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that we do. And we definitely need to be conscious that um, we could help whenever possible. The hurricane season. So the hurricane season is here. It goes from June to November. And the hurricane season, the Atlantic hurricane season, I should say, in the Northern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. So we typically have some named storms and they come with some destruction, particularly in the Caribbean and the Southern United States and Central America. And occasionally we get some up east here in the northern part of, uh, well, in, in North America here. In, um, we did get Hurricane Sandy back in uh, 2012. And Hurricane Sandy was one of those things that hit you so hard. We had, especially, it, it took a lot of people by surprise. We had basically communications infrastructure, cell towers being overloaded we lost internet because we lost power. And it might be a good idea to look at internet alternatives, um, including ham radio, but also, I don't know, maybe Starlink or something. I've, I've been looking into that. Or even uh, cellular connectivity. But that could be problematic, um, especially since everybody's using it. But, you know, it's, it's good to have options. Look into getting yourself, even if you have... FRS and GMRS radios, you know, talk to your neighbors and see if they want to probably get some radios and then you guys could do some drills and see if you're ready for communications. And with your ham radios, make sure they're working, make sure you have antennas and make sure that you have backup plans for antennas because hurricanes blow around things and you're not going to be able probably to use some of those big antennas on a tower um, you might still be able to use them, but if we have a strong enough hurricane, those might get blown down and damaged. Um, be sure you can have the ability to throw up a wire in a tree, because that typically is an effective antenna. You, know, you have a dipole or an NFED. Make sure you have that available. Make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you have ample food and water. Um, one of the things I've been doing for water is, well, we have a, a well, but we have a manual pump for the well, too. But for drinking water... And well, well is drinking water, but for drinking water, I have like bottles of water and I have a little battery powered pump and also a manually operated pump, but the battery operated pump uses very little power. It charges from USB-C and you can essentially pump out water from these big five gallon bottles. So, you know, I have a number of them stashed away that I keep and, um, you know, I, I rotate through them and I use them for my drinking water, but I always make sure I have a supply on hand. So it's always good to do that. Make sure you have a flashlight. 
um, several flashlights to be honest make sure you have ones that could use different types of batteries you know you have if you have rechargeable ones keep them charged if you have ones that are um, using disposable batteries make sure you have an ample supply of disposable batteries and check the expiration dates because they do have expiration dates so yeah so it's always good practice to use your radios you know practice get on the air and make some contacts and that is that so and practice for making contacts is field day so field day is coming up and we have some very you know the the field day has kind of morphed around a while originally Hiram Percy Maxim's vision of this contest was to test portables and then gradually they change it up you know the ARL through the years has changed it up to include emergency preparedness so you see like a lot of decorations going around you find that people reach out to their local officials to um, go on field day and this year you should probably look your club it should probably look to invite your member of Congress because there is legislation being proposed that benefits amateur radio and it would not hurt to have a member of Congress come out and see what you guys are doing see how you are prepared for emergencies one and two generally things that you do in amateur radio you, you don't only do the traditional HF contacts right you do things like satellites and digital modes and you know, show them that ham radio is a good, relevant thing. And, um, yeah, apart from that, I would say have fun and be sure to uh, be safe. Make sure you do your RF exposure evaluation, which I've been talking about on the YouTube channel, where you go to the calculators. There's a video I have on Ria's Ham Shack YouTube for RF safety. You can look that up. That has all the RF safety information. It has links to calculators where you can calculate your RF safety, print it out and document it and keep it at your field day site. And maybe put some ribbons around your antenna so that people don't go too close to them because they'll be exposed to antennas, to RF. Whether or not you think it's a problem, hey, it, it could be a problem, but you definitely want to be safe for that. All right, well, I've talked enough about field day. Um, like I said, I'm going to miss field day. I'll be in Germany, but I'll probably get on remotely and see if I can operate. My house operates from emergency power, so I'll be able to uh, claim some points. Who knows? Okay, so uh, let's uh, take a break, and we'll come right back with the news right here on Ria's Ham Shack. So, you know, one of the great things about having HF radio is the ability to work DX. But you need to know where you can find this DX. And you can actually find all the latest news, tips, tricks, scuttlebutt, and on-the-scene reports at dx-world.net. That's dx-world.net. My friend Call and his fabulous crew of correspondents bring you all the latest DX news from around the world right into your ham shack. Okay, so check out dx-world.net and they also supply the news here on Ria's Ham Shack. So if you want to get the source of the news, you go to dx-world.net. That's dx-world.net. So let's talk about the news and there is a fair bit of news this week. Let's talk about Hamvention and Dayton Hamvention has been um, in the news um, because they've had a quote-unquote record and attendance. Well, you know, they've been, I mean, in my experience, I didn't see that many people inside. But from what I was told, there are a lot of people outside. So they're, um, they had a, a tally of uh, 33,861 people at the Green county fairgrounds so i believe they use tickets to gauge that the total is um more than how much the you know they the previous record which is um 32,472 so they even um they topped that okay so that's good to good to hear good to hear that the event is um, that it is 
having more attendees. And um, one of the things that was probably that that was probably good for Hamvention attendance was the weather. I mean, I when I went to Dayton Hamvention, the weather was absolutely gorgeous. We only had rain like I think Saturday morning we had a little bit of rain. And the rest of the time, it was nice. It was sunny. It wasn't too cold. It wasn't too hot. And people were outside. So this this really went well for them. Really happy for that. Really happy that we have uh, good weather, so to speak. So um, kudos to them. And I hope next year is even bigger. Shifting gears a little bit, I would like to congratulate my friend Ed Wilson. And Ed is N2XDD. He is the new... Hudson Division Vice Director, so he replaced the person who replaced me at the ARL. Nomar NP4H, he moved up to the director slot after I left. And um, and then that the vice director was vacant, so Ed came in and he got it. So I know Ed has been wanting to find a way to to contribute more to amateur radio up in this area so congrats to him i hope he does well he's been involved in a lot of different things he's been involved in m17 project which is a digital voice project that creates an open open fully open source digital mode and this mode will uh, allow um you know uh basically many different people to make different hardware and there's also um, firmware for it that could um, be put into different radios via the open rtx project and the most important thing is that unlike some of the radios from um, you know the radio manufacturers and there's nothing wrong with the radio manufacturers by the way i love the radio manufacturers they don't have to buy chips from dvsi And one of the problems with amateur digital modes over the years was that, yes, the standards were quote unquote open, except when it came to the voice codec. So the voice codec was closed and proprietary, and it was owned by a company called DVSI, and the name of the codec was called AMBE, A-M-B-E. And this has been a bone of contention among many radio amateurs who, in my opinion, rightly so, believe that anything on the bands should really be fully open open source and available freely for everyone to use not necessarily in price don't get me wrong i think that people should be able to make money from manufacturing radios and designing radios it's just that when you use something commercial closed and proprietary it kind of limits you know the reach so you find that some people might only be able to buy radios from one brand and then they have to buy a license and then what happens if the manufacturer goes out of business and they don't they don't allow people to license their intellectual property you're up the creek without a paddle you might have invested things like repeaters and other stuff and then you're scrambling now to figure out how to use it so um i like i like the amateur digital modes by the way i like d star and DMR, and I don't really have much experience with Yesu System Fusion, but um, D-Star is an open mode up until the voice codec. So D-Star is okay for data. I think it's open for data. Once you get into voice, it gets a little murky. But anyway, so um, I've, I'm rambling on here. So Ed, Ed has been involved in that, and Ed's also been a first responder in New York City. And he, so he knows a lot about um, that kind of stuff. So kudos to him and I wish him the best and I wish Nomar the best. And I, like I pledge to always support them. And uh, Dan Romanchik, KB6NU, he has left, he's retired from ARDC. He was their communications manager. So he's now leaving and that spot is vacant. And um, hopefully, you know, we get somebody soon. I say we, because I'm part of ARDC. We get somebody soon to fill that role, but it's been wonderful working with Dan the few the few weeks I worked with him, and uh, you know us being fellow media people, it's always um, sad to see when uh, people go. But you know 
I'm sure he will do better. I'm sure he'll be in demand. And um, I really hope that he, um, I wish him all the best. So let's talk about something that's sort of related to amateur radio, but it's more about wireless technology. The FCC is aiming to make millimeter wave spectrum available to smaller wireless providers. So right now, if you have a cell phone that does 5G, a smartphone, and you do like this, it has like the UC or the UW, chances are that it's using millimeter wave, particularly if it's a Verizon phone. And um, by the way, the person who made all that possible is Ted Rappaport, N9NB. He pretty much um, did a lot of the foundational work for millimeter wave and 5G. So the FCC now, uh, the big boys get millimeter wave, and now the FCC is kind of looking to level the playing field. So according to draft NPRM, and um, the FCC had a meeting, it said that the 42 to 42.5 gigahertz band um, doesn't have any activity on it. So the adjacent band, um, 42.5 to 43.5, has radio astronomy users. So the commission wants to protect those users by limiting power. So anyway, um, the, the the FCC wants to give 500 megahertz of millimeter wave spectrum between 42 and 42.5 gigahertz to wireless providers on a shared basis. So this is going to be, it's and they're going to target, I, I suspect they're going to target smaller wireless providers. Uh, so the big boys already have their spectrum and the FCC is going to give them that. So um, they're going to, uh, Jessica Rosenworcel said that how their goal was to come up with a new model to lower barriers, encourage competition, and maximize opportunities in millimeter wave spectrum. So um, they might also divide that up into five 100 megahertz channels. So many possibilities, and I will keep a, a watch on this. And you know, speaking of the FCC, people say how the FCC doesn't find CBers and amateur radio operators. So here the FCC find they propose a penalty of $25,000 against Jamie uh, John Leon, the owner and operator of a Citizens Band radio service station in Rockford, Illinois, um, for apparently engaging in unauthorized operation and violation of Section 301 of the Communications Act of 1934 as amended, and Sections 95.933 and 95.957 of the Commission's rules. So, um, and then they go in and they explain all the framework. So, um, between December 21 and June 2022, they got complaints from CB users in Rockford, Illinois, uh, alleging that someone um, who people complained believed to be Leon had been making a lot of one, multiple one way transmissions for extended periods of time, including recorded comedy routines air raid siren sounds and digital noises. An FCC field agent traveled to Rockford, Illinois to investigate on June 21, 2022, approximately 5 p.m. The agent observed a continuous data transmission on CB channel 39. 40 channels between 26965 and 27495 megahertz are allocated for CB communications. So CB channel 9 is 27.395 megahertz. And the signal was unintelligible data like noise. And um, of course, um, the operator of a CB radio service station may use that station to transmit two-way plain language voice communications to other CB stations. So anyway, um, the transmission continued for 30 minutes and other people weren't able to access the channel. The FCC used direction finding and traced the source to an antenna mounted on a house and they gave his address here. And um, they found a, a 2006 Honda Accord <laughs> with Illinois tags parked in a driveway. And they found that the vehicle was registered to Mr. Leon. And um, in September 20, the commission mailed a notice of unlicensed operation that um, you know basically voided his authorization to operate the CB stations saying that um, 
uh, the, he was unauthorized to transmit. On uh, separate 28th, Leon telephoned regional director. Leon denied the allegations, but stated someone placed a milk crate containing a battery-operated transmitter at a corner near his house, and then he had found similar items on prior locations. Well, um, the regional director advised him to submit this information and writing along with photographic or other documentation. Leon promised to send a written response, but he's not done so, and he hasn't provided any information or documentation. Uh, the field agent returned in October 21, and um, the field agent observed the continuous signal, and then uh, using direction finding track the source of the signal to the residents, and um, the transmission ceased as the agent drove past the house, and of course, the agent did not see a milk crate or any sort of box. So anyway, um, yeah, this this guy, um, according to the FCC report, he has a history of non-compliance, and um, you know he uh, he didn't pay his past fines. I don't know if he's going to pay this one, but um, yeah. So it's you know the FCC is looking. Um, I'm quite surprised that they're doing some of this enforcement now. So. A milk crate. What do you think about that? Anyway, hat tip to Michi Bradley over on FCC Today. You can check out our channel. She um, gave me uh, this story. So I'm sure our friends from Ukraine are going to love this one, especially our, our correspondent Alexander. Listen to his news reports. I always love his news reports on WRMI. Uh, Sergei Ribrov was named the Ukraine head coach. And those who know Sergei know him as um, UT5UDX. And he also holds M0SDX, TA2ZF, and UT0U as a Ukrainian contest call sign. He's also operated from Cyprus, 5B4AMM. So he is named the Ukraine head coach for their um, soccer team. Soccer, football, you know, in America we call it soccer. I call it football. <laughs> it's it's uh, association football. Yeah, so he is the new head coach. And um, congrats to him. You know, ham radio operators are famous for a lot of things. So congrats to him. He's well-known. And it's always nice to, to have a well-known ham uh, that you know. Meanwhile, in India, HamFest India is uh, shaping up. You can get your tickets for HamFest India 2023. Um, they have... Uh, I'll put a, a link on my YouTube channel or in a Substack, actually. You can get it in the Substack. So you go to n2rj.substack.com. And um, but if you look for HamFest India 2023, it should come up. It will take place at Science City, Buyang Dev, Sola, Ahmedabad, and Gujarat in India. So um, it's going to be Saturday, November 25th to Sunday, November 26th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, they have the registration fee is 500 rupees, which covers the delegate fees, the delegate kit, breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, snacks throughout the event. If you have an accompanying shortwave listener or a spouse, their registration fee is 500 rupees. Children accompanying the main delegate do not require registration unless they're sorry. They do require registration unless they're below five years. So, yeah, so anybody under five years old is not um, required to register. So it's good. Um, yeah, uh, good luck to them in India. There are a couple of conferences coming up in India. Of course, um, we also have the Oscar India conference coming up as well. And this one from the RSGB. If you're looking for an interesting event, International Museums on the Air, it'll take place on the weekends of the 17th and 18th of June and 24th and 25th of June 2023, you'll get a participation award for all stations that register, and uh, you simply assist the organizers within the, with the administration of the event and provides those taking part with an indication of how many stations will be active. So International Museum Weekend's uh, website, and it's called radio-amateur-events.org forward slash I. M W, 
And the goal of this event is to set up amateur radio special events at many of the museums as possible throughout the world. And then you could make HF, VHF, and uh, uh, APRS packet stations set up. But, um, of course, that's entirely up to you. You have um, lots of museums, and it's very uh, nice to have them on the air. So if you have a local museum that you support, and you can get an amateur station in for those two weekends, the 18th and 17th of June, and the 24th and 25th of June, you're more than welcome. That will be great. And finally, if you were in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Seaside, Oregon, there was the CPAC convention. So CPAC was the ARRL Northwestern Division Convention. It was held in Seaside, Oregon on June 2nd to 4th. And uh, Steve Goodgame, K5ATA, the Education Learning Manager, delivered the keynote address. So um, it's a very nice conference. I believe ARDC was there as well. And uh, there was a Saturday ARL membership forum by Mike Ritz, uh, W7VO, talking about the year of the volunteers. And, um, of course, everybody's talking about volunteers. Re uh, really nice workshops in that one. I think I'll go to that one one year. We'll see how that goes. So that is the news. And let's take a break. We'll come right back with Q&A. All the ways to listen to Ria's Ham Shack, let me count the ways. The first and the best way is, of course, on WRMI Legends 5050 on your shortwave dial and other frequencies as appropriate. You can also listen on the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast. You can listen on WRMILegends.com where we have it on the live stream. You can catch it on Ria Hamshack YouTube channel. Just look for youtube.com forward slash at N2RJ. I publish a show and it's always a few days after it airs on WRMI Legends. And if you want to get the show first, you go on WRMI Legends 5050 shortwave or on WRMILegends.com. Of course, you can also go on WRMILegends.com to find out ways to support the show and support the station and to keep the tubes glowing and keep the fabulous shortwave programming coming. Now, back to Ria's Ham Shack. Okay, this is your favorite segment, the Q&A questions and answers, where we answer your questions and you can send your questions to Ria at n2rj.com that's romeo india alpha at november 2 romeo juliet.com and of course um if you have a question no question is too small no questions too dumb we love answering your questions so please send me your questions so the first question comes from heather and she asked uh, she sees that there is also eqsl in addition, uh, what do people think about this? So she knows that the ARL does not accept QSO confirmation. That's if you make a contact, you confirm. Uh, the ARL does not accept it via EQSL, but is it worth using? Seems kind of clunky as I have to go check my log to confirm every QSO. Don't know if it's worth the effort. Okay, so to begin with, it depends. Here are some of my uh, things I like about EQSL. I can use it for the DARC, the um, Deutsche Amateur Radio Club Awards. I can use it for CQ Magazine Awards, including the Work to All Zones Award. And so it's useful for that. And the nice thing about it is that compared to Logbook of the World, you don't have to pay like a per QSO, per contact, per confirmation fee. Whereas Logbook of the World makes you pay for each contact. You have to buy credits for each one that you want to use towards awards. And it's a different pricing model. They want you to do that because, I mean, the servers aren't free, the software development isn't free. So I don't blame them. EQSL has a different model. They tell you buy a membership that you pay, I think it's like, what, $5 or $10 or something like that. And then you can use that for your awards. So that that is always something different. The things I don't like, um, 
apart from, in general, I mean, you know, between Logbook of the World and EQSL, their user interfaces are kind of, you know, a little dated. I mean, but they work. So, I mean, they, you know, they're really not a problem. The problem I have is with multiple locations. EQSL has a problem where that if you're using multiple locations, if you're operating from multiple locations, you're going to have to create a separate account for each one. Yeah. So every time you change location, if you change grid square, if you change state, you have to create a separate account. And I discovered this the hard way because I operated from JK2 triple T. And, um, you know, I had to create a separate account for that. So I, at one point, I just didn't bother because if I'm operating from multiple locations, it's going to be a nightmare to manage that. So, you know, it's not really, it's not really optimal. I'm sorry. I'm hoping they rectify this sometime. But that, that to me is the major blocker. But if you just operate from home and you want to upload your contacts from home or one location, you're fine. I think you could do that. They do allow you to upload images, to download printed QSL images. You cannot use these images as QSLs for ARL awards unless you you mail them to the other person, have them sign the contact. So it pretty much defeats the purpose of having an EQSL. But they're good for CQ awards. So I have a couple of CQ awards that I got via the EQSL. I got the WAS, five band WAS award. No, I didn't get the full five bands worked all zones. I got, um, you could start from, I think 175. So I got like 175. You can use that. You can use EQSL. Um, I have WPX awards, worked all prefixes. You can have the, um, uh, CQDX awards. And one really nice award that's very tough to chase is the county awards. So you can work the USA dash CA. And it's important to note that yes, you can work, you can use confirmations from Logbook of the World for some CQ awards, such as the WPX work prefixes. You can use it for the WAZ worked all zones. You cannot use it for the county awards. You cannot use it for the CQDX awards. So, I, and part of this has to do with the allocation of resources at the ARL. They're very tight on um, what they can afford in terms of um, programmers to um, to fix logbook of the world. Here's a really simple question with a complicated answer. What's the difference between a balan and a choke? So a balan means a balanced to unbalanced transformer. So you're taking a balanced input and you're, um, you have a unbalanced output, right? So balance would be something like 450 ohm um, window line or even TV twin lead, whereas unbalanced would be coax. And the difference between balanced and unbalanced is that in an unbalanced system, one of the leads is connected or referenced to ground. So this is why coax, you have the shield, which is connected to ground. Now, um, as a matter of fact, if coax was, the shield was not connected to ground, it'd probably be balance, mm, maybe. But um, yeah, so, but balance definitely, you have like a um, uh, equal, you know, equal and opposing currents on them. Um, on each of the lines and they're not referenced to ground. So um, the balance converts, um, uh, it converts the balance to unbalanced. Now a choke is actually pretty much a, well, you have different types of balance. First of all, you have voltage balance and current balance. So voltage balance uh, they try to ensure that the equal and opposite voltages appear on the output terminals. Um, current balance will ensure that equal and opposite currents flow. The one-to-one -one current balance is pretty much um, the same as a common mode choke, and it's you know people will use that 
to essentially choke off common mode currents, which were common that um, currents that will flow on the outside of your coax and possibly um, uh, get back to your radio and cause hot mic syndrome. <laughs> like your, it'll cause your mic to be hot or hot chassis. Like you key up and then you have your um, RF on your on your radio chassis. So, long story short, um, you know, there is a difference. I mean, a, a choke could be a ballon and um, a ballon could be a choke, but uh, generally um, a ballon, its purpose is to convert balance to unbalanced and a choke is purpose is to stop uh, current um, common mode currents. Now, um, coax, by the way, you have equal and opposite currents flowing on a shield compared to the center conductor. And um, so any electromagnetic field you have there set by one is canceled by the other. And of course, if you have two currents that are identical but opposite um, and you wrap the coax around like a ferrite, you know, a toroid, toroid, uh, it, if they're equal and opposite, that it really wouldn't have any effect. But um, if they become unequal currents, then you'll have current, a common, uh, common mode current on coax and then you'll have an electromagnetic field on the coax and will radiate so your coax will now radiate and essentially you wrap your coax around a toroid you're increasing the inductance of the coax but only to the common mode current so essentially you block it when you increase the impedance remember impedance is resistance to alternating current so here's a question that this person is a um a general and they're looking to start studying for their extra and so well you might ask first of all why do you want the extra license so the extra actually gives you it gives you a little bit extra <laughs> like like his namesake but that little bit extra is actually some of the most useful spectrum on hf if you plan to work dx meaning that you try you plan to contact foreign stations so the entire intent of the general was to provide general HF access and the intent of the extra was to provide access to the DX windows. And um, as far as how to study, well, you know, there are a few different ways you could study. I mean, you could get the, the usual books. You could get Gordon West. You could get, um, um, I don't have a study guide out yet, unfortunately. You could probably get ARL, their, their manuals. Um, extra class license manual too. Um, hamstudy.org is a good one. And um, you can actually get their thing for free. Um, Ham Radio Prep, I have a coupon. Uh, you could get 20% uh, off, use coupon code RIA, R-I-A. Um, ham Test Online used to be a thing, but Ham Test Online, they're kind of going, um, you know, they're going away. I think they're still up, to be honest, but um, they're still there. So Hamtest Online, I believe they're a supporter of WRMI Legends. So if you want to to go on and and go there, you can you know you can study. I mean there there are plenty of different ways. I mean <clears throat> the extra the extra I think you should uh, take time and study because it is a more difficult test. It's not as easy as the technician and the general might seem a little more complicated the extra is a whole different level they test your knowledge about a, a whole bunch of archaic things but the good news is you only need 37 out of 50 and um yeah so by the way those of you overseas you want to get a u.s amateur license you can get a technician general and extra the only thing is you need you need someone willing to test you so you need a VE team and there are several remote ones which will test you there's one in Australia I believe that will test you and you also need a US address and now you need $35 because the FCC is charging 35 US dollars all right um Marco asks is there a reason why self-spotting on a DX cluster is discouraged and um, not speaking about contests so actually in regular operation you can self-spot. It's really not not a problem for um, you know. Just don't do it excessively. 
But um, it all seems like for some people, they view it kind of like cheating. They view it where you can, um, you know, you're essentially announcing yourself on non-amateur means. So let's back up. What is spotting? So spotting essentially is there are networks called the DX cluster where there are um, websites and also a telnet feed, like a feed that would show DX stations where they are, what frequency they're on. And it used to be done via packet radio. And packet radio is essentially um, an older system that uses um, you know, digital radio transmissions at lower speed. But eventually that migrated to the internet and we have the packet cluster. Now, the DX cluster. So, um, yeah. And a lot of people think, well, you're supposed to spot other people, meaning that you're supposed to post a DX spot for someone else to alert people that there's someone else. If you're engaging in shameless self-promotion, yeah, people frown upon that. In contests, people frown upon that. The contest organizers don't want you to be pimping your station on non-amateur means. Except the ARL kind of allows it now in some contests, I believe. So... You know, they um they kind of embrace the, the new the new way of doing things. So yes, yeah, so there you have it. Alright, that is um that's what you do about uh, self spotting. So this question is about cruise ships. If I want to take my my ham radio on a cruise ship, what do I have to do? So first of all, I'll tell you that cruise ships they generally ban a lot of things for a lot of reasons. Some of them in safety, some of them security. I mean, obviously you can't take things like firearms and stuff on cruise ships, um, not only because you're going to international waters and international destinations, but they just don't want the trouble. Um, but um, ironically enough, well, strangely enough, they actually started to ban ham radios because they didn't want people, I guess, transmitting and interfering with the ship's radio. So, you know, I don't know. I mean... For me, when I if I go on a cruise, I've never been on a cruise. If I go on a cruise, I want to, uh, I guess, enjoy the cruise. <laughs> Am I going to leave my ham radio home? Probably. Unless I'm going somewhere specifically to operate. If I'm traveling, I'm going to travel with my ham radio to somewhere where I know, you know, that I'm not going on a cruise, but on a cruise, no. So to, in order to operate ham radio on a cruise, even if it's a handheld, you need to get permission of the captain. And it's important that you get this in writing, okay? Because, you know, orally is probably not enough. Writing is ironclad. So if it gets disputed later on, well, they can say, yeah, you know, um, uh, yeah, you had in writing. Although sometimes that's not worth the papers print on, but that's a different thing. So anyway, that is um, that is the the best uh, advice I could give you that um, cruise ships just leave at home one and two um, if you really want to try get permission of the captain they used to allow it a lot more but now I don't think they do so another question about call signs let's say I have a call sign N2RJ which is my call sign and uh, stroke Sierra Sierra 15 slash SS 15 for I guess 15th anniversary of the SS Minnow I don't know but anyway, um, yeah, you can say it, uh, basically the call sign stroke SS15, and we call that a identifier. So how it works is that an indicator, I'm sorry, not an identifier, an indicator. How it works in the United States and other countries, but I'll tell you about the United States, is that any call sign can have any uh, indicator appended to it after you use the slash key. So essentially, you have the call sign slash something or the other, and this could be anything, because legally, only the part before the slash matters. There are some exceptions, and the exceptions are if you're operating in a foreign country, you have to abide by their regulations, and particularly in Canada, how it works is that you say your American call sign slash the Canadian uh, regional indicator. So, like, for example, if I go to Toronto, I will say N2RJ stroke VE3 stroke Victor Echo 3. 
Um, other countries pretty much make you do it before. So they'll be like, for example, Trinidad will be 9Y4 stroke N2RJ. Or, you know, I go to, well, I have a call sign UK, but if I want to do it in the UK, it's Mike stroke N2RJ. If you have a um, uh, another call sign, you know, uh, in, in another country, you have to use that call sign. You have to use that license generally because I think that supersedes your foreign license. Now, as far as the indicator goes, the other thing in the United States is that you have three indicators that are used for special things. So you have slash KT, that's for people who upgrade from novice to technician. Believe it or not, there are still people with an amateur novice license. If you operate from novice to technician, as soon as you pass the test, before it even gets submitted to the FCC, you can sign slash KT, that's um, a temporary technician, so you can operate with your new privileges. And that's only when you're operating with your new privileges. So if you're still in the novice subbands, you can still use um, your w without the slash KT. Same thing if you operate from technician to general, which seems to be the most common upgrade, you can operate slash AG, alpha golf slash AG. So let's say I have a call sign KB2XYZ stroke AG, right? I just passed the general test. I will be able to sign that immediately after I pass the test. For extra, it's alpha echo. So let's say I passed my extra, right? And my friend, um, I hope my friend Kat, uh, W4DXY, I hope she passes her extra. She passed her general. If she gets her extra and she just passed the exam before the FCC updates its database, she can sign W4DXY stroke AE, alpha echo. Now, the thing about it is that these are fine for upgrades, and these are required when using upgrades. You cannot use these in other cases. So let's say I set N2RJ stroke AE. Well, technically, that would be against the rules because, um, you know, or N2RJ stroke AG, right? AE might be okay because I'm an extra. But if I use N2RJ stroke AG, well, no, I'm not a general. I didn't just pass my general test, so... I can't use that. And then if I use that for, I don't know, celebrating the attorney general, no, not really. That's not going to work. So it's not, you know, it's it's not something you want to you want to do. And here is one. If you have a vehicle with amateur radio license plates, are you supposed to um, sell the vehicle with the plates or do they go with the car? So in most states in the United States, the plates actually go with the owner. And I had this situation where my old car, I transferred the plates to my new car and I just basically kept, you know, the old plates. Now, there was a lag between where um, Tesla actually had to title the new car and get it registered. So they told me, use the temporary paper plate until you get the registration in the mail. And that took like a month because they're just slow. Come on, Elon Musk. Why can't you speed that up? And um, they actually, um, well, once I got my new registration, I was good to go. And it saved me some registration fees. So I just took the plates off and then I put, put the plates on. I ended up ordering new plates because I'd actually um, crashed the other vehicle and the plates got bent up. So it was really not um, uh, in any good state to put on a new car. And um, some some uh, people, um, some states, the plates go with the vehicle. I've never heard of that. I know in some countries they they go with the vehicle, so it's not. Um, but I don't know about the United States. If in your country you have that practice, probably let me know. Ria at n2rj.com, Romeo India Alpha at n2rj.com. Uh, so Randy writes, a neighbor installed a bunch of solar panels on his roof and he's hearing an interference on 10 meters all day long, reduces to almost nothing at night. Um, any re recommendations on what steps could be taken? Um, yeah, um, talk to your neighbor because, um, because that's how you get it resolved. Because unfortunately, you cannot go and interfere with your, solars, your neighbor's solar setup because... That could be pretty, pretty problematic. 
I'll tell you why. Because you'll be trespassing um, without their permission. And um, even if you have their permission and you modify something and the solar company, some of these solar companies have remote monitoring, you don't want to do anything without their authorization. Because some of these solar setups might actually be leases where the homeowner actually doesn't own the solar panels. They're leased to the homeowner and then the homeowner will just get the electricity. They pay a reduced rate for the electricity and the solar panels stay on their roof. So um, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't do that. The ARL lab has kind of been helpful in some of that, although they've kind of run into some problems based on my experience. They've had um, they've had some good response with some of the solar companies, I'll tell you. But some of them have kind of been, well, you know, we're not going to not going to help. Um, their opinion is that, well, yeah, it passes FCC specs, barely passes FCC specs, like the solar companies, or it might not even pass at all. And, and to begin with, on HF, there really isn't anything that protects from radiated emissions. Conducted emissions that go down the power line, yeah, but radiated, no. The good news is that the interference is usually only during the day, unless your neighbor has a battery system, in which case you'll get it at night too. And a lot of solar systems are incorporating batteries. And um, I would really recommend that um, you know you at least talk with your neighbor because sometimes the solar companies will fix things. They'll replace inverters. I know Solar Edge has actually kind of done that a couple times. I've known um, them to replace inverters and other components. They have components called optimizers, which are basically DC to DC converters, which will allow them to combat partial shading, where one of the solar panels is shaded, and it kind of um, cuts the power to the rest. So that is that. Well, you know, this has been another uh, episode of Ria's Ham Shack. Um, but before I actually go... I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Main Trading Company. I believe they're celebrating 14 years. Congratulations to them. And I appreciate their um, support of WRMI Legends. So kudos to them. Um, they're a great place to buy equipment from, mtcradio.com. All right, uh, so this show is heard every week on WRMI. We have a new time. I'm not quite sure what it is. I believe it's 9 p.m. Eastern on Fridays, so um, look out for it, uh, WRMILegends.com, you can find all the latest ways to support the show, WRMILegends.com, would like to thank everyone who makes the show possible, and including uh, Ted Randall, Holly, and the rest of the crew at WRMI Legends, and of course uh, the crew down at WRMI in Florida, Jeff White and his um, crew, and of course everybody else who makes it possible, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am Rhea and to RJ, and uh, this show is my opinion and my opinion only. It's not approved by anyone in the amateur radio community except me. And uh, I, you know, WRMI is not responsible for what I say, nor are WRMI legends. But uh, I always try to to keep it on the level. All right, my friends. I hope you enjoyed listening. And as usual, if you want to QSL the show. You can send your request to Rhea at n2rj.com. That's Romeo India Alpha at n2rj.com. If you want to send a physical uh, reception report, you can do so to P.O. Box 73, Sussex. That's Sierra Uniform, Sierra, Sierra, Echo X-Ray, New Jersey 07461. That's P.O. Box 73, Sussex, New Jersey, 07461. And I'll send you a card and we have stickers too. And, um, you know, I'll uh, tell you, I'll, I'll autograph it um, with my, whatever my autograph is worth. Okay. All right. Well, until next week, I guess at the new time, I am Rhea, call sign N2RJ, saying, especially to our friends in Ukraine, we've been going through some hard times lately. Peace and 73 to all of you.